we have been discussing extraction of lead from galena and uh, we have seen that it follows a very logical route you take lead sulfide that is roasted to form oxidized substances lead oxide lead sulfate etc and we do that in a sintering machine so that during roasting it gets sintered also we do not produce fine products we produce particulate matter particles which are nice and hard which can go into the blast furnace it is necessary because the concentrate that is coming out of flotation is very fine if you just roast it as it is then whatever you get will be very fine we don't want that so the roasting is done in a sintering machine dwight lloyd sintering machine which is a continuous operation so from the concentrate we get uh, the particulate matter sinters which are suitable for going into the blast furnace now if you look at the flow sheet this is what is happening that we start with a lead ore that is mostly lead sulfide which which always contains some zinc sulfide maybe some copper also definitely iron sulfide other impurities some valuable impurities after concentration most of zinc sulfide can be separated by differential flotation in the sintering machine now we are going to put uh, we are going to produce uh, the blast furnace uh, feed sinters during the process some fumes will go out zno pdo etc that will go for zinc recovery and after in blast furnace reduction process reduction by coke we need to add coke plus flux plus some iron scrap for recovery of lead we will produce several layers on top will be a slag this slag will necessarily contain some zinc and it has to be treated for zinc recovery we will have a mat and spice two separate layers or maybe one layer it has to go to copper converter the main uh, output we are aiming at is the base bullion of lead which will contain whole lot of impurities and the precious metals now this base bullion is treated where there are some standard chemical treatment steps they have been used for centuries and they have evolved out of trial and error some i may have referred to earlier and or i'll just quickly go through them now first of all there is this step of drossing you know the melting point of lead is very low 327 degrees the base bullion is kept just above the melting point in a suitable furnace air is allowed to blow mild air blast and continuously if it is stirred there are many impurities which will form oxides and spread and float up and they are skimmed off after that it will go to a slightly higher temperature 500 to 550 degrees when sulfur is added copper is taken out as copper sulfide then it goes to a desilverizing step it's a very famous process called parks process which will come again and again in many metallurgical steps if you add zinc then zinc takes out all these precious metals and forms a crust solid crust separates out then there may be excess zinc that we have added to lead so either the zinc is separated by vacuum or we can add chlorine and that chlorine will form zinc chloride which would also be a vapor after dezincing it goes for bismuth recovery the standard technique for removing bismuth is addition of calcium and magnesium or potassium 
this forms uh, intermetallic compounds with bismuth and if it will form a crust it will go out after removal of bismuth zinc precious metals copper etc and all this we get a refined lead which will be the uh, refined base bullion this is the treatment now people have argued that the blast furnace process for zinc for lead production although it is a convenient and well known process it has the drawback of potential lead environmental problems coming from lead we may have electrostatic separators on top we can have bags to collect fumes but still people have been looking for some alternate process now at present 90% of the world's primary lead is provided by the by the conventional process of sintering followed by blast furnace reduction and about 10% by what is known as imperial smelting process to which I will come little later it is a process that is applied for simultaneous production of zinc and lead from concentrates which contain both zinc sulphide and lead sulphide and such concentrates are very common and we have imperial smelting process operating uh, in Rajasthan in Chetri. But now the recent environmental protection laws which seek to control emission of lead fumes into the atmosphere coupled with shortage of energy needed for lead production dependence of coke etc etc have necessitated development of processes that are both cleaner and less energy consuming one way to be less energy consuming will be if we combine the roasting sintering blast and uh, reduction step into one reactor if you can like copper production have continuous production of lead in a reactor then of course we will uh, save on energy things should also be it will be higher technology and the it is such a smelting process one step continuous smelting process appears attractive and there the principle will be to directly go from lead sulfide to lead not to an intermediate oxide sulfate and all that start with lead sulfide go to lead like in the case of copper we start from uh, copper pyrites concentrates go straight to uh, copper and uh, roasting smelting converting they are all combined in theory it is possible for lead I have given a phase diagram but the, this this uh, diagram is little more complicated actually I have shown in the equilibrium phases in lead sulfur oxygen system at 1200 degrees centigrade at this temperature metallic lead with 1 to 3 percent sulfur can be produced in presence of pure SO2 you, you see it for yourself but I would rather go to another diagram that in theory straight from lead sulfide we can go to lead at around 1200 degrees centigrade and it will contain only 1 to 3 percent sulfur provided we have very high PSO2 value. Now you will recall that in the very beginning uh, when I was discussing general principles of extraction I had shown you a diagram some typical diagrams for sulfur oxygen metal systems. I do not remember whether I had shown this diagram but the diagrams are like this say for consider you want to see what will happen if lead sulfide is oxidized by oxygen whatever be the reaction you will produce SO2 so we can actually analyze the equilibrium between different phases and draw these lines I remember having drawn some lines also so typically it is not accurate representation 
but if you plot a diagram at a given temperature between P S O 2 and P O 2, we get can get boundaries of different phases. We can go from lead sulphide to P D S O 4, we can get from lead sulphide to P D S O 4 P B O, P B S O 4 2 P B O, P B S O 4 4 P B O, only P B O. In theory, one can go straight from lead sulphide to lead also, provided you can control the P S O 2 value. And that is what is the aim of some new developments that people are trying. Of course, they have not been very successful yet, you know, they are commercial processes, but if we could do that, then we will uh, make things very simple. We take lead sulphide in the reactor, it will produce lead, and of course, it will produce SO2, it can be collected, it can go for lead recovery. Now, let us leave lead aside and go to extraction of zinc. Incidentally, we do produce lead in our country, as I have mentioned in Tundu by the blast furnaces, about 15,000 to 20,000 tons per year there, and as well as in Vizag also, we produce lead. But it is only by the blast furnaces. Some lead is being produced elsewhere by imperial smelting process, which I will discuss in the next lecture. We will now talk about extraction of zinc. Now, I need not tell you about the importance of zinc. You should know about some common uh, uses of zinc. The maximum use is as protective coating of steel. We call it galvanizing. So, if you have steel pipes, we dip in molten zinc and when you take it out, there is a thin layer of zinc on top of the steel pipe. All the galvanized pipe you see in the market that we use for plumbing, they are all coated by zinc. The zinc does two things. Firstly, it forms an impervious zinc carbonate layer by reacting with CO2 in the atmosphere. So, it is a physical barrier where the any corrosive atmosphere liquid or, or gaseous cannot come in contact with uh, the steel pipe. It also protects electrochemically because zinc protects ions by being more electropositive. If you remember the electromotive force series, zinc is above ion. So, if there is a corrosive atmosphere that wants to attack ion, zinc will get attacked preferentially and unless all the zinc is gone, iron will not be attacked. It is similar to the cathodic protection using magnesium that I discussed some time ago. If magnesium is hanging from an undersea structure and is kept in contact with the structure, in a corrosive atmosphere it is magnesium which will be sacrificed and the undersea structure will be protected. Similarly, the zinc layer will react with the corrosive environment in preference to the steel pipe it is covering. The, so, that is electrochemical protection. There is also a physical barrier of zinc carbonate. Then there is very wide use of zinc as brasses, copper zinc alloys of many kinds. There a zinc uh, extent of zinc can vary. Zinc is also attractive because of its low melting point, high structural strength, good dimension stability and it is ideal for die casting because of dimension stability. Rolled zinc plates are used in dry cell batteries. All the batteries we are using, they, they, there is a zinc in them. It is also used in paints and pigments. So, zinc has very wide application. We have moderate reserves of zinc in the country and 
we have been producing zinc industrially for quite some time. But remember my first lecture, India is the first country to produce zinc in the world and India started producing some around around in the 5th century AD or 6th century AD and the industry in Rajasthan peaked around the 11th, 12th century before the Muslim invasion. Then things became secretive, they did not stop till until about 17th century after the decline of the Mughal power when the Marathas invaded, then the mines were abandoned. But many of those artisans went down south, but indigenous production of zinc suffered because around 19th, 18th century the westerners learned how to distill zinc. The reason why ancients could not produce zinc is that zinc oxide when reduced by carbon produces zinc vapor which escapes. So, you have to have a way of condensing the zinc, you need a retort process and Indians had mastered the retort technique, both vertical retort as well as horizontal retort distillation process long, long ago. And those retorts are even seen today, hundreds of them on the hillside, many with charges intact because they have been abandoned very suddenly. That method continued for a long time, there is a spirometallurgical technique. There was no question of hydrometallurgy because hydrometallurgy culminates in electrolysis. Electro electricity was not known till about 200 years ago. So, there was no question less than 200 years ago. So, there was no question of a hydrometallurgy of zinc and zinc could not be precipitated by cementation like copper can. If you have copper sulphate solution, if you put iron filings, copper will precipitate because copper is a very low in the EMF series, but it is difficult to take zinc out of zinc solution, zinc. So, mostly world was the zinc was being produced in the world by pyrolytical processes until electricity became um, available as an industrial commodity. But till today, zinc stands out as a unique metal in that there are at least six different processes in full commercial operation in its production. There are six processes still competing with each other and they all have their utilities. There are certain areas where uh, one method uh, would be more appropriate, in another place another would be more appropriate. Now, I had made an estimate some 20, 30 years ago. This may have changed a bit to just to give you uh, the names of these processes. One is the horizontal retort process, commercially adopted in 1800, vertical retort process, commercially adopted in 18, 1930, but this horizontal and vertical retort process was there in India for centuries, but of course, in the older form. Then there is electrothermic means instead of the heat is supplied by electrodes in reactors. Then there is the modern electrolytic process in hydrometallurgy and there is imperial smelting process which I have been mentioning repeatedly is a blast furnace process for simultaneous production of lead and zinc. Lead will come out at the bottom, zinc will come out as vapor on the top and it will be condensed. Now, you see the relative proportions about one third or say a more 25 percent was being done by the pyrometallurgical processes, more than half was by hydrometallurgical processes, electrothermic processes are almost negligible and imperial smelting processes at that time was about 11 percent. This I guess is increasing, so is increasing and pyrometallurgical processes perhaps will slowly decline. Now, the sources of zinc are several, but generally we talk about ZNS which is phthalerite. This is the main mineral. It does not mean you get zinc sulphide. I, I repeatedly tell you this sulphide 
zinc sulphide will always be associated with many other sulphides, also gang materials and in nature it will be a few percents at the most. It can also have some oxides associated, but these low grade ores can be concentrated by flotation and it can jump from a few percent one or two, three, four percent to fifty five percent zinc in one go, as good as that. Now, zinc sulphide is a mineral which has a very high melting point, but the concentrate can be roasted at much lower temperature, eight, 800 degrees centigrade, to produce zinc oxide. This oxide will be ground, agglomerated, because again, again in retorts, you cannot feed absolute powders because some permeability is required. We may not need big particles or sinter, but we need agglomerates. Even the ancient Indians used to make small balls of zinc and carbon and then put it in the retort because there also gases have to come through the charge. So, they, they can be agglomerated or sinter to provide feed for retorts. Zinc oxide reduction takes place at around 1200 degree. Zinc distills off for collection in condensers. They have to be designed very carefully. The reactions are this roasting gives you zinc oxide, then for reduction zinc oxide will be reduced by carbon monoxide at 1200 degree centigrade and the flow sheet like this or grinding flotation lead and copper concentrate are differentially floated out rock is separated because it will settle means there are ways and means of using flotation reagents where you float out one sulphide remove it then you can float the other sulphide so you can get two three concentrates of different uh, met with different metal composition we can get a zinc concentrate 50 to 60 percent zinc after roasting we get zinc calcine SO2, lead, cadmium, these fumes will come out. This is only the pyrometallurgical step, but after one gets a zinc calcine, which would always have some uh, sulfur, then we need to go for sintering some cases or other kinds of agglomeration to make small particulate matter. Again, some fumes will come out, then the agglomerates go for retort distillation. Retort distillation will be 1200 to 1400 degrees and you will get zinc vapor. The residue will have lead, iron, copper and ZNO powder. The zinc vapor will be condensed at about 450 degree centigrade. We will get liquid zinc. Melting point of liquid zinc is around 420. From the liquid zinc will be treated by vacuum and vacuum distillation will be pure zinc what will be left behind will be lead and cadmium. It is a simple um, flow sheet for extraction of zinc by reduction of ZNO by cal cal uh, carbon. The thing is same for vertical retort or horizontal retort, it is the same thing. Now, for the I, I do not want to give you the design of the uh, retorts, that is not very important. And besides, uh, the pyrometallurgical process of zinc is also not as important as the hydrometallurgical uh, processing of zinc. We will come to the hydrometallurgical processing of zinc now. The flow sheet for the hydrometallurgical extraction process for zinc is based on the following scheme. First, dissolution of zinc calcine in sulfuric acid, you take zinc in solution, you precipitate cadmium by adding zinc dust, a cementation process, zinc dust to leach solution, this cementation process some cobalt and copper can also be removed. Now, a very important point to note is that cadmium is always associated with zinc. So, whenever there is a zinc plant, it necessarily produces cadmium. In our country, we produce cadmium from the zinc plant and that takes care of our cadmium need. 
Thirdly, we precipitated cobalt from leach solution and for precipitation of cobalt, there is a standard reagent called alpha, alpha nitroso beta naphthol. You may have done it in chemistry classes. Fourthly, adjustment of pH of the leach solution to about 5.3 to, hydro, to hydrolyze aluminum, iron and addition of MnO to oxidize iron to the trivalent state and to produce a precipitate that is flocculent and can absorb the entire quantity of arsenic, antimony and germanium. Now, these are all chemical uh, process steps, chemistry and you need not know all this except in some very standard techniques that are being used. That will be clear if you look at the flow sheet. After calcination and treatment with H2SO4, interesting thing is cementation. You have zinc in solution, you put some extra zinc in solution, then cadmium will come out. That is the cadmium recovery. Filtration, the precipitate mainly will be cadmium because cadmium is cemented out by addition of zinc and then the filtrate will be treated by alpha nitroso beta naphthol, the standard uh, chemical for precipitation of cobalt. The solution now goes for electrolysis. It will give zinc 99.95 percent pure. It will liberate H2SO4, which can be recirculated because you need it for leaching of the calcium. So, I had mentioned once that in acid leaching, you generate acid. Whereas, in alkali leaching of anywhere, you consume alkali. So, in as this acid leaching, you actually can generate the acid and uh, circulate that. Let me stress one or two important points. <coughs> there is a step here, even in this hydrometallurgy, there is a pyrometallurgical step of roasting that zinc sulfide has to be has to undergo combustion to form zinc oxide. This is a very critical uh, operation because it has been found that if you over oxidize means if the roasting temperature is not right, then you form a ferrite which is it is a compound. You can write it also as Zn Fe 2 O 4 this ferrite is not easily leachable, it is not reducible, means one makes a refractory compound. So, at no stage should this form, one must not form this uh, compound ZNO Fe2O4. That is the most important point. Then secondly is this point that zinc is high in electrochemical series and therefore, the electrolytic solution must be free of cadmium, lead, copper, iron, silver, etcetera, etcetera or else zinc deposited on the cathode will be contaminated. Try to understand this. We have zinc in solution. We have some Suppose there are some other things in solution which are less reactive than zinc. Then once you deposit zinc on the cathode, that zinc will react with these impurities which are less reactive, precipitate those and it will dissolve. I mean there will be cementation of this impurity element at the cost of zinc from the cathode. We do not want that. It is necessary, absolutely necessary that if we have to go for an electrolytic process for zinc recovery from a solution, the solution has to be absolutely pure. So, before going to electrolysis, there are lot of precautions, lot of chemical steps to ensure complete removal of impurities from the solution that will be electrolyzed. Now, there is 
a very interesting situation here. We can live with zinc, which is less pure, because most of the zinc that will produce will go for galvanizing. Galvanizing does not need 99.95 or 99.99 percent pure zinc. It can do with less pure zinc, because in galvanizing all that we need is that the uh, iron pipe, a steel pipe will be dipped into a layer of zinc and get a zinc uh, layer uh, covering that. We could do with zinc which is not that pure, but you cannot afford to produce impure zinc in electrolytic process. So, we are compelled to produce a zinc of a purity which really may not be required for many applications, but there is no other way. We cannot settle for lower purity in electrolytic process and therefore, we end up producing a zinc which is very, very pure and purity will be 99.95 or 99, because there is no impurity in the leach liquor that we are electrolyzing. Try to understand this again. Leach liquor has to be pure, because if it has impurities that are less reactive than zinc, then zinc after it gets deposited in on the cathode will re-dissolve to cement out this impurity. Okay. Hence, purification is necessary prior to electrolysis. For copper, we do this afterwards. Remember, we, we produce copper by electrolysis, but the copper produced in cathode is not pure. So, we have an electrorefining step, where, where we take anode copper, which is thick. We take a sheet of pure copper and from the anode copper during electrolysis, copper is transported to the cathode. Impurities that are very noble, precious metals they fall off as insolubles at the bottom of the uh, anode. Impurities that can go into solution, they go into solution. So, in the case of copper, we do not need very pure leach liquor for electrolysis. In the case of zinc, we do, because zinc is a highly electro positive metal, not very highly, but it definitely is above hydrogen, whereas copper is far below hydrogen. So, this basically is the scheme for uh, this. Now, let us see whether we have Let us see what we do in, in uh, the zinc plant that we have in Debari. It used to be called Hindustan Zinc Limited. It was a government owned company, but now it belongs to Sterlite. So, it is called Sterlite. They are producing the, the zinc for the country today. The from the Zawar mines, we get lead sulphide, zinc sulphide concentrate and of course, some miscellaneous things. The concentration plant at the mines produce lead zinc, lead rich concentrate this goes to lead blast furnace as I mentioned Tundu in Bihar. There we get lead silver as byproduct. The zinc sulphide part of flotation, the concentrate containing 55 percent zinc goes to the zinc smelters in Debari, where it is roasted to produce ZNO it is dissolved in H 2 SO 4. Then there are various hydrometallurgical steps, pure liquor electrolyzed we get zinc. The cadmium rich precipitate goes through various hydrometallurgical steps to produce 
cadmium. And of course, there are various other precipitates we need not discuss. The basic steps are treatment of ores to obtain a concentrate rich in zinc, roasting of the concentrate to convert the zinc in a soluble form, the treatment of the concentrate to form a zinc sulphate solution, purification of this solution by precipitation of impurities, removal of zinc from purified solution by electrolysis, then melting of zinc sheets to form inverts. These are the steps followed in Devari. Okay. Now, let us come to the imperial smelting process, which I was mentioning now and then. The imperial smelting process aims at producing simultaneously lead and zinc in a blast furnace. So, the advantages would be simultaneous smelting of a low grade complex mixed charges of zinc and lead ores to recover both zinc and lead. The we would aim at overall thermal efficiency, which is higher and zinc recovery also will be more economical. No electricity will be required like you know if you go for an electrolytic route, you are using electricity, there will be no electricity requirement. Of course, you require some coke because you are going to do blast furnace operation. The furnaces available today are of variety of sizes, means one can choose a size appropriate for the production that one aims at. This furnace operation is continuous and fully automated. I mean it goes on and on and on provided you deliver a uniform input the controls take care of minor variations, there are automation all around and it will work for months together until the furnace has to be stopped for repair. It could be after 2 or 3 years because you know any blast furnace needs change of the lining etcetera after some time. This mechanism is robust by robust means it can stand shutdowns and restarts. If there is a problem it can be shut down and it can be started again. This is not possible in the case of an iron blast furnace because it is too huge an affair. An iron blast furnace once shut down cannot be started or again, it is not possible. This is a smaller affair and it is possible to achieve that in this case. So, what is the imperial smelting process? Here is a schematic diagram of the imperial smelting process. At the center is the blast furnace and it has you know if you have taken a course in steel make iron making, it has also the bell hopper you know the charging mechanism very much like what you have in a blast furnace, but of course this furnace is smaller. It also happens to be of square cross section because in the, the reason why um, the blast furnaces for iron making has a particular shape is quite historical. It has evolved over centuries because especially if you use agglomerate sometimes they expand. So, to allow the expansion of uh, agglomerates they, they provide bigger volume downwards there are also other reasons, but here we do not have that kind of a taper excepting towards the bottom there is, there is a taper because by the time the mass of the charge begins to get reduced because from zinc oxide all the oxygen is going out, we are beginning to have liquid zinc, it will occupy less volume. So, there is a taper here. Now, what happens 
when this blast furnace. It is operating like a lead blast furnace. Lead oxide is being reduced by carbon. And so, zinc is vapors would have to come out from the top, lead and slag will come out from the bottom. So, here that lead will containing lead will separating lead from slag. So, there is a separation process which takes out lead lead bullion here and the slag will come out from the top here. Now, in the case of iron blast furnace, we have two separate outlets one for slag, one for pig iron. They both are very high temperatures. Remember, remember? In the case of lead, the melting point of lead is very low. So, as soon as it flows out, lead will get frozen and slag can flow on top of that. So, we we can take it out from the same outlet. We have the two years also exactly the way there are two years for um, in the blast furnace. Incidentally, you should always know why the two years look like this, why it is not straight down, why it is not straight down. I used to wonder until I found out actually if it is like this, you can have a window here through which you can see what is happening in the two year zone. So, there is a it is possible to view the two years from here. Now, the other things here are mentioned the zinc vapors that are coming out from here will be treated in a chamber in a very special manner. This diagram is downwards and I would explain. Same here the zinc vapors that are coming out is entering into a region of a very special treatment of zinc vapors. Other things are fairly simple and I would explain that a little later. Now, in case there is copper in the charge, in some imperial smelting processes another layer comes on top of lead that contains a matte layer which will have copper. Unfortunately, that is not very desirable and operation suffers. Generally, the imperial smelting process occurs best when the only product is lead and the fumes come out from the top. I will go to the next part little later in the next lecture, because I will have to refer uh, to the phase diagram to show you how the zinc vapor condensation is accounted for. So, let us review what we have done so far. Today, we started with treatment of the base bullion. Now, the lead that is coming out in the imperial smelting process is also a kind of base bullion. So, it will also have to undergo all these steps for refining. That lead that is coming out is no different in the imperial smelting process than what is coming out from the blast furnaces, because that is also a blast furnace, this is also a blast furnace. The only difference is that in the imperial smelting process, we are taking a feed which has zinc oxide. We do not have that feed in the normal lead blast furnace. Otherwise, so far as the blast furnace side is concerned, the operations are similar. So, we will have all the steps for the lead that is coming out of imperial smelting process. And these are standard processes, drossing, sulfur treatment for copper removal, Parks process where zinc is added for removal of silver, gold etcetera in the form of a crust. These dissolve in zinc and they come out. Dezinking by chlorine and vacuum is a standard process. Removal of bismuth by calcium, magnesium, potassium is a standard process. These processes will be applicable in imperial smelting process also. We are now jumping 
from ordinary lead furnace to imperial smelting furnace where lead is coming and zinc is coming, we still are not able to find a process where we can start directly with lead sulphide to produce lead in a continuous manner. I mentioned it is possible in theory. If you look at the phase diagram, one can go from lead sulphide to lead. If you have the right control of PSO2 and PO2, but such a process um, has still not been put into practice. It may be conceptualized, there may have been some laboratory development, but there is no industrial process. We are going for a continuous operation of a different kind that the imperial smelting process, which is a modified version of the lead blast furnace that can operate with both lead and zinc um, inputs. As regards zinc, and we discuss imperial smelting process after zinc because in India, lead concentrates are available where zinc concentrates are available. So, the imperial process of lead zinc extraction is in Rajasthan. It is very near that Rana Kumbhas, uh, that memorial. It is very near uh, Queen Padmini's palace and where and all that historical places. What is that place called? I will just recall it later. But if it is only zinc sulphide in the concentrate, then we, we go for the, the hydrometallurgical treatment, where uh, zinc sulphide is roasted and the calcine is taken into solution and from the solution we will have to go for elaborate purification steps and then to go for electrolysis. That is the standard process for zinc. In imperial smelting again we are we need this process especially in India because the lead sulphide concentrate is coming with zinc sulphide concentrate in Rajasthan. There is no coke there. We cannot have lead blast furnaces operated there. So, that comes all the way to Tundu. Lead blast furnaces also operated operate in Vaizak. I think they get imported concentrates also. It will be advantageous to produce lead then and there itself. So, imperial smelting process makes it possible. And this is the diagram of the imperial smelting process. Now, I had started discussing zinc by saying that there are some five processes of making zinc. Of them, there are two horizontal and vertical retort processes are pyrometallurgical processes. There is also one electrothermic where you know you have uh, electric furnaces, but that is not much in operation. Then you have the electrolysis process and the most recent is the imperial smelting process, but it is a metal where we have multiple options. In India, we only have the hydrometallurgical method. I do not think there is anything else that I need to uh, recapitulate now. I will start with a very interesting thing of imperial smelting process. How do we condense zinc vapors to recover zinc and ensure that there is no back reaction? Mind you, with zinc also coming carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide vapors. 
and it is operating at a lower temperature than say ion blast furnace. There will be CO2 there. There will always be a chance if we do not take adequate precaution, zinc will back react with CO2 and forms ZNO. In ancients, what they used to do, you have seen those retorts I have shown, they had found a way of a retort distillation where a part of the retort always came out of the furnace. They were air cooled, I do not know whether they did any other kinds of thing. So, the vapors as they came out of a uh, came out, they condensed there and there was an escape route for gases very ni nicely designed. We do not do that kind of thing. We do not depend on natural condensation of zinc vapors. It is a very special way of condensing zinc vapors that I will discuss in the next lecture. Thank you.